Eu vou dizer que tá... Ok? Selamat, Merdeka. Happy National Day. This is August 31st and you're probably watching us if you can. And if you are, uh, welcome to another uh, Inside Talk. Uh, my name is Jahaba Sadiq. Today, my guest is Professor James Chin. Uh, he was once based in Kuala Lumpur. Now he's based in Tasmania, Australia. Uh, he is head of the Asia Centre. Uh, he is from Sarawak. Uh, he's a long-time observer of uh, Malaysian politics and a very astute and eloquent speaker on issues of the day. Tonight's uh, insight will cover broadly three areas. Uh, we'll break it into three sections. One is the road to Malaysia, the road that led us to September 16, 1963, when four territories, Malaya, Sabah, Sarawak and Singapore, formed Malaysia. Second part, we will talk about the relationship between the federation, the federal or the centre with the various territories, namely Sabah and Sarawak because Singapore left in 1965. And the third part, we will talk about issues of the day that has cropped up over the last few years. As you very well know, every August 31st, or around that date, we have this debate, is it Merdeka? Is it National Day? And so what is September 16? For that, Professor Jameson, do explain the road to Malaysia. Well, thank you very much for the kind invitation, Jahaba. It's always a pleasure to work with you and to talk to uh, your viewers about this issue. I think the problem now in Malaysia is that there's been a lot of misunderstanding. And I think uh, a lot of the misunderstanding comes from the fact that our history books do not really cover the formation of uh, Malaysia uh, really well. In fact, if you look at our official textbook used in Tikatan, Ampat and Limak, uh, the formation of Malaysia is, is covered basically from the viewpoints of a very few uh, Malay leaders. And also the entire process is described as a very smooth process. And of course, uh, that is not true. So I'll start off by saying that uh, we have to understand that the process itself, although on paper looks simple, it was actually quite complicated. That's the first point. The second thing I need to uh, remind your viewers is that the process itself occurred within a very specific period of time in the 50s and the 60s. And during that time, uh, the political climate around the world and in the region was completely different. So the big thing after the Second World War was, of course, the Cold War. So we're talking about the formation of Malaysia occurring during that period when there was great competition between the West and the East. And I think many people uh, take a look at the process purely on the ground, what was happening in Malaya, North Borneo, it was then called Sarawak and Singapore and Brunei, and forget that uh, the regional forces and world politics actually play a role. So maybe I'll start off by talking uh, the formation uh, and the environment in terms of the international politics or the international uh, side of it. Um, I think once your viewers understand that, then they understand better why people did certain things at the local level. So in terms of the international environment, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the Cold War played a very important role. But the key thing was, um, in 1960, the West, essentially led by the US, they decided that uh, colonies were not a good thing. So in 1960, the United Nations General Assembly actually uh, passed a thing called the Declaration on the granting of independence to colonial countries and people. So essentially, the UN, which in itself also opposed uh, Second World War body, decided that you know we really must try to move away from the colonial system. Because one of the analyses made by the West was that uh, the colonial system set up by the West was one of the major reasons that led to Second World War. Uh, you also have to remember that it was also this period that Great Britain was no longer great. Coming out of the war, they were very poor, they needed to rebuild. And there was great pressure on Great Britain to remove themselves. So the dividing line, so the arbitrary dividing line, they call it East of Swiss. The idea was that they get out of Swiss. So I'm sure your viewers, some of them who study history, will know that in 47, 
uh, India became independent, so the Britain again played a key role there. Mm -hmm. In fact, they were the ones who drew the partitions and we know it became very messy. Millions of people died. But a far more significant event happening very close to our region was in 1949, mm -hmm. when China became a communist mm -hmm. or the Communist Party took power. So immediately you can understand why everyone got excited. You remember all the colonies of Southeast Asia were basically ruled by European powers yeah. and suddenly China, communist power took over. Mm -hmm. So you had an immediate threat on, on, on your doorstep. So it was during this time that the British government thought that, you know, if we are forced to live with the UN declaration on, on granting independence colonies, plus the pressure of the Cold War, plus the UN declaration, if we're going to leave the region, then obviously if you're sitting in Whitehall in London as a colonial official, mm. um, you do not want it to be very messy. Yeah. So what are the two things you look for? The first thing is that you want to have a single entity to put all the British areas that you control, uh, the, sorry, the territories that you control. You don't want it messy, so you try to create one political entity. The other thing is that you have to make sure that that political entity is friendly to the West. <laughs> Obviously, you don't want to, to, to leave the place and then that place turn to be communist. So basically, I think the British knew this and they sort of uh, encouraged to go up to Raman to sort of think about how are we going to bring all the British territories together. At that time, the key British territories were Malaya, Singapore, North Borneo, Brunei and Sarawak. So when Tunku Abdul Rahman went to Singapore and, 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 and and gave a speech at the Foreign Correspondent Club on the Malaysia proposal, and this was in May 1961. Essentially, he said that, yes, I think that it's a very good idea. Mm -hmm. We should come together. But besides the idea of the British wanting a single political entity, for Tunggu Abdul Rahman, he had his own political calculation. Mm -hmm. Now, um, it is quite obvious that he wanted North Borneo, Brunei and Sarawak within this proposed bigger federation. As mm -hmm. you know, Malaya was already self-governing in 57. He wanted it because if he was going to bring Singapore in, that would disrupt the racial arithmetic. That's right. He needed the Bumbutra population to balance on it. Borneo in order to balance it out. So that was where it came, uh, came across as, as a, the Greater Federation. So what was the process then? Well, the process itself was quite straightforward. The other thing to remember is that the actual timeline was actually very fast. Uh, it started in May 1961 when Tunku made the proposal and the whole thing was completed on 16th of September 1963. So essentially we're talking about a period of two years. Yeah. So the first process was essentially he decided to reach out to not the people but the elites in, in Borneo, mm -hmm. uh, namely North Borneo, Brunei, Sarawak and Singapore. Mm -hmm. And they set up a thing called the Malaysia Solidarity Consultative Committee, or mm -hmm. MSCC. Mm -hmm. A series of meetings were held, and it was at this meeting that the elites of, of, of Sabah and Sarawak, and initially Brunei before they pulled out, mm -hmm. where they came and talked about this proposed federation. And it was also at this meeting that they decided that, uh, yes, it's a good idea, mm -hmm. but we sort of want to ascertain the wishes of the people, and secondly, we want sort of a set of guarantees. Yeah. Uh, so most of the lobbying was actually done in this period because we know from historical records that initially, uh, some leaders, especially people like Donald Stevens from Sabah, was very negative about this. But he was sort of convinced by Tunku and Lee Kuan Yew that this was actually a good thing. Mm -hmm. And during this process, they also brought community leaders from uh, the Borneo side, uh, took them for a tour of Singapore and, and Malaya, which in those days was far more advanced and said that if you join us, you will enjoy, yes, of course. And the idea was that you will enjoy the fruits of development within the Federation. So after the process, uh, one of the important, there were minutes of all these meetings and everything, the important thing that came out of the MSCC was that they said that, okay, uh, the political elites of, 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 of uh, the Borneo states plus Singapore Malaya, we're ready to proceed. Mm -hmm. So obviously for something as important as this, we need a process. So the process was a thing called the Cobo Commission, and this was a government body set up by the Malayan government, British government. And the idea was that this commission will go to Borneo Island, talk to the people, and see what were the wishes of the people. Yeah. Um, it was called the Cobalt Commission because it was led by the former band uh, of England governor called Lord Cobalt, mm -hmm. and essentially consists of Malayan officers and some British officers. So they went on a month-long tour of Borneo, and they went to uh, Sabah and Sarawak, mm -hmm. and they held what is known as public meetings. Mm -hmm. The idea behind these public meetings was essentially anybody can give them written submission, mm -hmm. appear before them, and speak about uh, 
how they think this federation should work. Mm -hmm. uh, the important thing to note was that um, they did not meet any real resistance in Sabah because at that time the political parties were not very well established in Sabah and the two most important figures in Sabah policy at that time, Donald Stevens and uh, Mustafa Harun, mm. were already in agreement that yes, we will support this. As I mentioned earlier, you know, yeah. Tunku and Lee Kuan Yew uh, managed to convince Donald Stevens, the skeptic. Um, they had some problems in Sarawak. In fact, when it came to Sarawak, uh, there was a series of writings. Mm -hmm. And uh, what is uh, not often uh, uh, understood is that uh, the writings were actually engineered by the current ruling party in Sarawak, the Sarawak United People's Party. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the SCPP then was basically, uh, uh, although it was led by moderate leadership, the bulk of the membership were left-leaning. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of the branches were actually controlled by a thing called the Sarawak Communist uh, Organization. Mm -hmm. So they organized a uh, protest. There was writing. They tried to stop the public hearings in, in Kuching and a few other towns. Uh, but essentially, end of the process was that they received the famous formal uh, written request. Mm -hmm. In Sabah, it was, the eight, it was the 20 points. In Sarawak, it was the 18 points. Mm -hmm. So this is where the 20 points came about. Mm -hmm. So to break it, uh, to sort of summarize it, basically after the trip, uh, basically they said, okay, um, after long discussion, we completed the report. Our conclusion is basically one third of the people we met and the people who submit uh, documents to us said that yes, we really want the Federation of Malaysia. Mm -hmm. The other one third, they sort of said yes, but we have to be careful because uh, North Borneo and Sarawak are so far behind, mm -hmm. we sort of want the set of guarantees and this is based on the so-called 20 points, the sort of things that we, points, we, we yeah. wanted to, to ensure that we have a high level of autonomy. Mm -hmm. And they said that the one third uh, were basically people who were not in favour of Malaysia. Mm -hmm. But several important things in the report was that uh, they also said that 20 percent of the population of North Borneo and Sarawak uh, were never going to support Malaysia in, in mm -hmm. any case. Mm -hmm. So that was essentially the, the Cobalt report. Mm -hmm. So from the Cobalt report, uh, mm -hmm. the governments accepted it. And they said that, okay, so how do you operationalize all the things written in the COBOL report? Mm -hmm. So the next stage is actually the most important stage, mm -hmm. which is the Intergovernment Committee or the Lansdowne Committee, the mm -hmm. IGC. Mm -hmm. So that process was actually picking up all the important elements of the COBOL Commission mm -hmm. and you operationalize it by making sure that the elements that was raised in the COBOL report will be inserted into the 1957 Malayan constitution, which is used as template mm. for the new constitution. From Malaysia, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. so they set up basically five subcommittees, mm -hmm. and uh, let me just check my notes to make sure I get it right. The five subcommittees were, um, excuse me. Okay. Oops. Too many paper. Okay. So the five subcommittees were the Constitution Committee, mm -hmm. Fiscal Committee, mm -hmm. Legal and Judicial, Public Service and Departmental Organization. Mm -hmm. So each of these committees met with the elected leaders and unelected leaders, uh, uh, colonial civil servants, and they worked through this and said that we're going to put as much of the report of the COBOL Committee, what people wanted into these five committees, and these five committees met recommendations how they will be inserted into the Constitution. So that's basically how the constitution came about. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. the, before I finish on this was that basically there is, um, looking back at history, the major, major criticism of the COBOL report was that um, the British used the entire civil service to support the process. Yeah. And therefore, because they support the process, it was very difficult for people to oppose. Secondly, the native population of North Borneo and Sarawak did not really understand uh, so, for example, uh, it is almost certain uh, things like sovereignty. There's no such word in the Iban language or mm -hmm. the Dayak language. And also, there's probably no such word in, in the Kadazan language at all. In fact, it was written in the report that uh, some of the native people appearing before the Cobalt Commission said that we will go along with whatever the British tell us to do. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think it's quite important to see the limitations of, of, of the consultative process, and that so it, has been it was a, it was a loaded dice in, in, in Spain. In some ways, it was loaded because the British very early on uh, 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 pushed for the process, and also the other thing that was not reported at that time was that now we know that in June 1961, immediately after uh, Tunku announced the Malaysia proposal, there was a meeting call for the four 
most senior British officials in the whole region. Mm -hmm. The Governor of Sarawak, High Commissioner of Brunei, the Governor of North Borneo, plus the British High Commissioner for the region. They had a meeting in Singapore and the decision taken at that meeting mm -hmm. was that you must use the entire civil service in this region to support Tunku. Mm -hmm. So um, in some ways, yes, it was loaded, but you have to remember, as I said, because of the international environment, they wanted just a single entity when they leave the region, and mm. therefore they push for it. Now, of course, we are judging it from 2017's, uh, not 2017 viewpoint. Mm -hmm. At that time, this was, like I said, completely consistent with what the British were doing. Mm -hmm. You know, when they left the place, they always try to, I wouldn't use the word manipulate, they want to ensure that the place had a strong chance of political survival. Secondly, the political entity they wanted to leave behind will be pro-West or at the very least pro-British. Mm -hmm. So for example, you can see what happened in India. When they partitioned it, they drew the line. Even though they allowed the Muslims to create East and West Pakistan, they made sure that all the leaders there were still pro-British yeah. after they left. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So, you know, you get a feeling 50 years later, 54 years later, uh, that uh, we were all sort of uh, corralled and herded into being Malaysia. Yes. Um, since then, you know, uh, one of the things I've always wanted to ask is uh, all the leaders in, in all the territories, uh, bar Singapore because they left in 65, uh, were very agreeable with each other because they were uh, allied in the same uh, coalitions and all that. Can you explain to us the federal state relations? One for Sabah and one for Sarawak, from '63 onwards to uh, recent times when, when you know the issues of the day has started cropping up. Sure. Uh, before I do that, I just want to add on a very, uh, very important footnote, mm. and this is again something not taught in our history textbook. Um, in addition to the initial opposition to Malaysia, right, one of the most interesting opposition to Malaysia was that three days before, uh, oh, sorry. One week before the Malaysian Federation was, was formally proclaimed, 16th of September, on the 10th of September, Kelantan State... Yes, they filed a... They filed a court, uh, sorry, a court case yes. to try to stop the Federation. Yes. So, we, to understand history, we just should not say that you know, the people of Sabah are unhappy. In fact, the Sultan, at least on paper, the Sultan's Lango was, uh, Sultan of Kelantan, Kelantan yes. was also unhappy yeah. with the process. The Federation of Malaya yes, was not... That's was right. not wholly agreeable to Yes, him. because he claims that as, as, the, as the holder of the Malay sovereignty, he was not consulted. Yes. So again, this is an example of how the British drove the entire process. So mm -hmm. that's the first thing. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing was that uh, in between what the British were doing, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Philippines started to make noises about uh, North Borneo and yeah. claiming that North Borneo belonged to them. And also during the two-year process, uh, Indonesia also came about and said that you know we want to create a thing called Indonesia Raya and therefore we started confrontasi mm -hmm. under Sukarno. Yes. So to cut the story short, basically Tunku had a meeting with the Filipino president and the Indonesian president in Manila and they agreed that you know we will do a second round of public opinion. Yes. So they sent a UN team uh, just before September to ascertain the wishes of the people. Yes. Now what is really interesting about the UN team were two things. One, the results was they said exactly the same. One third of the people supported the formation of Malaysia. Mm -hmm. One third said that they will support with guarantees. One third said they won't. But now historians have looked back and they found a really interesting telegram from the British uh, office in New York and the UN mm -hmm. that was sent to uh, the, the British uh, headquarters in London. Mm -hmm. And in the telegram, they said that we will make sure that the UN will produce the report we want. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So again, this is consistent yeah. what I said earlier. The British were pushing so hard and they really wanted to do it. And in that era, in the 60s, they were in a position to do it. Yeah, they were in the driver's seat. Yes, and also, yes. I mean, I think one fact about uh, the Philippines and uh, Indonesian objections was that it actually delayed the formation of Malaysia by 16 days. Yes, yes. Uh, it was supposed to be August 31st, 1963. Yeah. And uh, it was probably going to be September 14th. But incidentally, September 16th is also Lee Kuan Yew's birthday. Right. So therefore, Malaysia was formed on Lee Kuan Yew's birthday. Yes. A footnote of history that a lot of people don't want or don't need to know about. Yes. Now they know. So let me just do a quick takeaway on, on, on the formation of Malaysia. Yeah. I think the key takeaway is that the entire process was political in nature, and it was basically decided by London and, and Kuala Lumpur. Nothing short of a war would have stopped the entire process. Mm -hmm. 
in every start of the process, the British and Malayan government were already in agreement on the big picture that they wanted um, Federation of Malaysia to happen. Mm -hmm. So I think it is, uh, when people look back, they say, that, oh, you could have done this, you could have done this. You have to remember in that post-Cold War environment in the 1960s, like I said, nothing short of war would have stopped the process. Great. Yeah. So based on that uh, uh, background, the circumstances that birthed Malaysia, uh, how are the first few years and up to now? Uh, you know, uh, I think we were hunky dory for a while. Yes, yes. Uh, because yes. as you said, some people are unaware what what nationhood meant, what sovereignty meant. Uh, but you can you can take us through that because not many books on it actually. Sure. Let me talk about the federal state relationship for the last fifty years in relation to Sabah and Sarawak. Mm -hmm. I think we'll start with Sarawak. Sarawak, I think the story is easily told. Uh, by and large, if you look at federal state relations in Sarawak, you can sort of uh, uh, break into three very distinct periods. Mm -hmm. The first distinct period was from 1963 to 1970. Mm -hmm. And this is the period where the state tried to assert its rights. Mm -hmm. So what is happening now is nothing new. So during this first stage, you had a very strong state nationalist by the name of Stephen Kalanin Kang, mm -hmm. who was a strong... Uh, state uh, rights leader. In fact, his political party, interestingly enough, called Sarawak National Party, their tagline in those days was Sarawak for Sarawakians. <laughs> yeah. Uh. So everything old is new again, okay? But he was so strong mm -hmm. that this federal government, to cut the story short, basically had to impose emergency rule there in order to get rid of him. Yeah. And he was replaced by another Iban called Tawis Lee. The key takeaway is that Tawis Lee, although he was the chief minister, he was mm -hmm. being manipulated Mm -hmm. from the back by Muslim leaders. Mm -hmm. um, the second period of Sarawak rule is basically from 1970 to 2014, which is about 44 out of 50 years. Mm -hmm. uh, it was this period that it was essentially ruled by a single Malanao family, mm -hmm. uh, starting off with the uncle, uh, Tung Abdul Rahman Yaakub, yeah. who ruled from 1970 to 81, followed by the nephew, uh, who is the current governor of Sarawak, uh, Taib Mahmoud, from 81 until uh, recently. Yeah. So it was during this period where I would argue that um, there was great stability other than 1987. And it was also this period that, uh, interesting enough, because there was such a long period of stability, especially at Taib Mahmoud, that the Chief Minister of Sarawak, interestingly enough, in some ways became almost completely autonomous, especially towards the end part of Taib Mahmoud's rule. Essentially, although people said that uh, during Mahathir's time, his centralized power became very powerful, Yes, with the exception of Sarawak. Mm -hmm. And in fact, most observers would agree with me that, you know, he could uh, virtually do anything and it was very difficult mm -hmm. for the incumbent prime minister to disturb him uh, for all sorts of reasons. But the bottom line was that he was very clever in making sure that there was no Amno in Sarawak. And therefore, the Sarawak Barisan led by PBU was uh, solidly in charge of the situation and it was not possible even if federal government to intervene in Sarawak. So that was the second period. And of course, the third period is from 2014 onwards, when Taib Mahmoud stepped down, replaced by Adinan Satem. Mm -hmm. Adinan Satem immediately took a very strong state right stance. Mm -hmm. And basically, his position is that uh, we need, we really need to bring the balance of relationship back to a more even level. Mm -hmm. And we should try to strive for what was the original intention of the federation. In other words, a federation of equal uh, members in other words, Malaya, uh, Sabah and Sarawak, and a federation where the promise of autonomy and development mm -hmm. will be respected. Mm -hmm. But of course, we know that uh, tragically he died and is currently replaced by the incumbent uh, mm -hmm. Chief Minister Abanjo. Mm -hmm. And uh, the good news for many Sarawakians is that Abanjo is essentially following through on uh, what Adinan Satem is doing. Okay. okay. Now, in terms of Sabah, I think the story is uh, in some ways uh, more complicated. Uh, Sabah has always also had a rocky relationship mm -hmm. with the federal government and uh, Sabah's uh, relationship is essentially can be broken up into uh, four different phases. Yeah. The first phase was essentially from 1963 to 1975 mm -hmm. for the first 10 years and this was essentially a period of strong men uh, fighting out in Sabah. So mm -hmm. who were these strong men? The strongman was basically the Muslim leader, Mustafa Harun, mm -hmm. fighting against the Qadazan uh, leader, Donald Stevens. Mm -hmm. So during this period, there was constant competition between these two, and the situation got so bad that they had to appoint Peter Law as an interim chief minister in between. So basically, the bottom line was that these two were strong nationalists 
but because they were constantly fighting, uh, Sabah became quite weak. Um, the situation changed in basically 1976, because what happened was around 72, 73, mm -hmm. the federal government in Kuala Lumpur started receiving reports that Mustafa Harun uh, was thinking about taking uh, Sabah out of Malaysia. Mm -hmm. And there is some documentary evidence that suggests that he did put uh, together a proposal, a mm -hmm. paper called uh, The Position of Sabah in Malaysia, and that he sort of uh, hinted that, you know, if our relationship with Kuala Lumpur is not good, we might as well go our own way. Mm -hmm. So after that, uh, Kuala Lumpur decided to sponsor a separate party to take him on. Huh? Yeah. And that party was called Bajaya. And interestingly enough, uh, Kuala Lumpur decided that the person to lead Bajaya was Donald Stevens, <laughs> okay. Mustafa Harun's old arch enemy, mm -hmm. uh, who was actually shipped off to Australia as High Commissioner but was recalled to, to, to take Mustafa Harun on. Short story, there was a state election, uh, Bajaya won the election, but mm -hmm. again, unfortunately, we have the double seat strategy. Yeah. There was a plane crash, uh, Donald Stevens died with several key uh, Kadazan leaders, and uh, Hari Saleh, one of the junior ministers, became the chief minister of Sabah. Yeah. Now, because Hari Saleh in some ways was the accidental chief minister, he tried to be too federal, tried to, to, you know, tried to cozy up to the federal government because mm -hmm. he understood that you know, uh, he didn't have the political strength, because, as I mentioned, because the leaders died. Yeah. So he needed the backing of yes, Kuala Lumpur. Yes. And it was during this period where it was widely seen that he was being too federal. And the examples that Sabah Hans liked to give that he was too federal was that he ceded the island of Labuan. Mm. to the federal government and I think a lot of people in Sabah are still talking about it today. So it was this period as I said pro-federal and the next key period in Sabah occurred in 1985 mm -hmm. when the non-Muslim Bumutra population in, in Sabah decided that we need a new champion mm -hmm. and the new champion was of course the Hugan Sao, Pairin Kitingan, came out and formed a party called Parti Besatu Sabah and the key takeaway was that Parti Besatu Sabah Although it was seen as a political vehicle for the non-Muslim non Bumutra in Sabah, it attracted considerable support among right. the Chinese population. Mm -hmm. So therefore, uh, simple mathematics, you've got Muslim Bumutra, Bajaya under Hari Saleh, non-Muslim Bumutra under uh, Pairin Kitingan plus mm -hmm. the Chinese. Two out of three, obviously, Hari Saleh was in trouble. Mm -hmm. So in '85 there was an election and basically Pairin won the election. So for a very short period, there was a lot of instability in Sabah, and in fact, uh, Pairin was forced to call for another election. Mm -hmm. Again, he won handsomely, and it was during this period that I think Mahathir really didn't have a choice. He felt that, you know, uh, I cannot deal with, with uh, problems uh, if Sabah was under opposition government. So uh, he did a deal, and Pairin PBS became a member of the Barisan National. Then the next, uh, the next uh, controversy or the next uh, key point in Sabah politics occurred in uh, 1990. Uh, this was PBS in the middle of a general election decided to pull out the Barisan yeah, National. They, they followed uh, Tukur Zali. Yes, uh, the so-called Gagasan Rakyat thing. And uh, this was a key element and the key takeaway was that it was at this point that uh, Mahathir basically felt that I have to intervene in, in, in uh, East Malaysia directly. And, uh, I can no longer rely on the local proxies. You yeah. see, traditionally the way was and a hands-off uh, policy yes. on that. Yeah, traditionally it was that it's not hands-off, but traditionally I'll use a local Muslim to represent the yeah. so-called Malay. I'm not. Mm. I'm not interested. But with this sort of thing happening in Sabah, it was just too close. Yeah, and it was just too difficult. So in 1990, uh, at the heat of the moment, Mahathir decided that you know I had enough of all this nonsense. I'm going to export. Um, no MC, Gerakan, everybody moved into Sabah. Yeah. So one of the interesting things in Sabah, unlike Sarawak, is that Sabah have a lot of political parties, and some of these parties are actually West Malaysian Barisan National mm -hmm. Parties, mm -hmm. something that you don't find in, 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 in Sarawak. Sarawak yeah. So the next thing was 1994, uh, four years after uh, PBS left the, the Barisan mm -hmm. National, and mm -hmm. it was at this election that although PBS won, uh, immediately there was a slate of defections, mm -hmm. and uh, the government fell because of defections. Yeah. It was also this period that, uh, to, be, to be fair, Mahathir did try to reach out to all the groups. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned earlier, the Chinese and the non-Muslim Bumutra were angry with the Barisan National. Mm -hmm. He reached out by playing this thing called the Rotation Chief Ministership, yeah. 
which was quite unique in the Malaysian system, it's never happened in Malaysia's political history. Mm -hmm. And the way the rotation worked was that among these three groups I mentioned, the Muslim Bumutra, non-Muslim Bumutra and the Chinese, each of them will get a two-year term as Sabah chief minister. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, you and I both know the way politics work in Malaysia, right? There is no way you can do anything in this two-year period. Yeah. Uh, to say something quite seditious, the idea is that if you get in for two years, all your supporters thinking is that we can't plan, we can only mark as much as exactly. we can. Yeah. Exactly. So after a while, they decided to abandon the thing. So, you know, since Musa Aman became the chief minister, so basically for the last 10 years, you 15 know, years? Uh, for the last 15 years, sorry, uh, Sabah has not practiced this, this rotation thing. Yeah. So basically, the key takeaway from the uh, state's relationship with the federal government is that uh, initially, for the first 10 years, it was always a rocky relationship, mm -hmm. uh, both for Sabah and Sarawak. So people should not be surprised that it's always been rocky in some ways. The key difference was that Sabah was a bit more complicated mm -hmm. because the federal government intervened directly in 1990. But the other key elements was that after the federal government intervened, um, uh, there were attempts mm -hmm. made by leaders on this side in mm -hmm. Peninsula Malaysia mm -hmm. to ensure that the sort of the uh, Kedaza or non-Muslim Bumitra to make sure that they're no longer in a position to challenge the, the sort of the Barisan model, the Peninsula mm -hmm. Barisan model, mm -hmm. was that in Sabah we had, uh, how should I put it, like instant Megibi, we have this phenomenon of instant citizenship. Yeah. In Sabah they call it the PTI problem. But essentially the bottom line is that Sabah became a Muslim majority state mm -hmm. within basically two generations. So today, um, um, you know, even after so many years, if you go to Sabah, there's still a lot of resentment against the federal government mm -hmm. over essentially, like I said, three issues. The first is the Labuan issue, people mm -hmm. are still sore about it. Second, PTI issue, uh, there's a lot of suspicion that uh, the federal government was behind it, mm -hmm. the Sabah Muslim majority state. And of course, the third issue was the intervention where the West Malaysian Barisan parties moved into Sabah. Mm -hmm. And uh, many Sabahan, my Sabahan friends tell me that uh, that's the reason why everything is, you know, for lack of a better word, kalam kabuk in terms of politics in Sabah, because mm -hmm. there's too many parties. Okay. And that phenomenon has been there since 1990. Mm -hmm. Surat case, relatively calm. Obviously, there were a lot of uh, issues between federal state government, but because for a long period, Surat was mm -hmm. under uh, 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 sorry, uh, Ramang Yaakub and, and, and Tan yeah. Mahmud, uh, they managed to, uh, I wouldn't use the word resolve the issue, but the sort of uh, difficult issues never made it to the press. Yeah. Because uh, they control the, the, the thing quite tightly. So, of course, there were issues, unhappiness, especially over certain projects. But by and large, uh, the relationship function, because as I said, Taib Mahmoud is extremely powerful. Uh, all the Sarat parties supported him strongly on this issue of dealing with the federal government. And also, they never challenged Kuala Lumpur directly under PBS. Mm -hmm. So, although relationship was not always smooth, it was at least not up in the open. So, that is basically the key takeaway for, for Sabah and Sarawak. Okay. So, so, on this Merdeka Day, or Hari Kebangsaan as we said, uh, we have seen uh, in the last one, one, one year, 18 months, uh, or since Adnan Satam uh, became Chief Minister and subsequently passed on, uh, he asserted very strong state rights. Uh, it also came at a time when, when we have a federal government that has lost uh, pop the popular vote and, and for the second time running, lost its uh, much coveted two-thirds parliamentary majority. Do you think the situation at the federal level has encouraged uh, and pushed uh, both Sabah and Sarawak to assert themselves further and bring up issues which were always under the table, on the table this time? Sure. I think to understand uh, why in the last few years uh, Sabahans and Sarawakians sort of asserting and talk about the Malaysia agreement, um, I think the key turning point of the watershed movement was in 2008. Mm -hmm. um, in 2008, Sabah and Sarawak contributed 55 uh, MPs to the Barisan overall number 140. Mm -hmm. In 2013, Sabah and Sarawak contributed 47 MPs to the Barisan's 133 MPs. So simple mathematics will tell you that without Barisan national, uh, without Barisan national MPs from Sabah and Sarawak, uh, I'm nowhere fallen from power. Mm -hmm. So because of that, I think um, there was a need to assert themselves because they realized that for the very first time since independence, our votes, our MPs really count. Mm -hmm. The second important factor, and this is something that Malaysians often forget, was that all these things happened after Malaysia's strongman 
uh, to Mahathir stepped down in 2003. So uh, the people who came after him were seen as people who were not as strong politically as Mahathir. Remember I said that Mahathir faced problems in Sabah and he intervened directly. So this has not happened. So basically since 2008, um, I feel quite strongly that uh, Sabahans and Sarawakians um, felt that yes, after so many years in the Federation, after such a long period of, of strong man rule under Mahathir until 2003, 2008, you know, you had the national tsunami, but more importantly for us on the Borneo side, for the very first time, our MPs decide the outcome of the federal government. Mm -hmm. So obviously they re really think as in this is a unique opportunity for us to remind the federal leadership in Putrajaya mm -hmm. that um, there is such a thing as Sabah and Surat, we're far behind you and maybe you should think about you know where we stand in relation to the Federation. Uh, previously we couldn't do it because Mahathir was too strong and also previously probably the time was not right. I mean one of the things about organizing a social movement is that you need to connect people and you and I both know uh, in the 70s and 80s that there was no Facebook, there was no WhatsApp. I mean mm -hmm. how do you organize people? It was very very difficult mm -hmm. but now relatively easy you can organize people so for example you go to Sarawak, one of the defining things about Sarawak is that you hang around Kuching or even in the rural areas you find that people are flying the old Sarawak flag openly, uh, stickers on cars, Sarawak for Sarawakians. And in fact, um, you know, the whole small demonstration processions mm -hmm. flying the Sarawak flag openly, calling on, on the federal government to recognize the special status of, of, of Sabah and Sarawak in the federation. But, but isn't this, I mean, it's the main issue here is, didn't the governments of Sabah and Sarawak and the MPs who were co-opted in Barisan National uh, worked on the federal constitution that in a way eroded the special status of the four territories which later became the three territories they themselves did it and then now they're making noise about it sending a delegation to London and all that uh, so there seems to be a dichotomy here there seems to be at one level they helped form this and now at a level now they're making noise sure before I answer that I think we need to understand a summary of the issues yeah. so before I answer you I think I will summarize the issues are basically in uh, three areas. Uh, the first is basically after 54 years, is Sabah and Sarawak given the due respect as one of the three original founders of the Federal of Malaysia? Mm -hmm. And the side issue is basically that you know, you look at the way the number that is given every year. So, for example, great emphasis on 16 number for the people in Sarawak is actually 54. Yeah, they don't understand why you cannot accept the fact that uh, Independence Day which is, cannot be disputed, was actually 63. Yes. Why do you keep counting from 57? Okay, so this issue of due respect. Secondly, I think they said that, you know, linked to this is that in 1976, as you mentioned, there was a constitution amendment yeah. that linked Sabah and Sarawak as just one of the 13 states. The third one was, I think, they quite annoyed that, you know, as one of the two of the four states that came together to form the Federation of, of Malaysia, right? When Singapore was expelled, when they passed a special act of parliament, uh, you know, why was the leaders, and they were still alive in that then, why were they not consulted? Uh, we know that the negotiations actually took months and months yeah. behind the scene. And uh, this was completely kept in the dark for the leaders of, of Sabah and Sarawak. So they're unhappy on that point. And related to that point was that it was very clear, as I mentioned, one of the guarantees they were given was that Sabah, Sarawak and Singapore was to hold more than slightly one third of the seats in the post-Federation Malaysian Parliament yeah. to ensure that Malaya alone cannot pass any constitution amendment, yes. right? Because you need two thirds. So when Singapore left, left the Federation left, in kicked out. Well, okay. uh, sure, we can use words like expel, yeah. but basically it was act of parliament, okay? So it was done in a legalistic way. So basically when they, they were no longer part of the federation, right, the 16 seats should have been distributed to Sabah and Sarawak and they were not. So now Sabah and Sarawak basically control just slightly more than 25. So they're not in a position to, to hold back any constitution. The only thing they have is that without the MPs, the government will fall other mm -hmm. than that, okay? But I think the constitution the thing is quite important. So that's the first set of issues. Mm -hmm. The second set of issues is again, they keep talking about the set of guarantees, autonomy, and in the spirit of the Cobalt Commission, MSCC, right? And basically, the bottom line is that part of the original understanding was that uh, there was supposed to be a meeting held 10 years uh, 
mm. after the federation was formed to look at all the outstanding issues and see whether we're carrying on or not. Yeah. That meeting was called but never convened. Mm -hmm. So I suppose 41 years later, you can still convene the meeting and talk about all the safeguards and autonomy. Yeah. Um, related to safeguard autonomy, the three or four other issues that annoy the people of Sarawak and Sabah is that first is bonionization. Mm -hmm. It was very clear, as I mentioned, when the leaders of Sabah and Sarawak joined the federation, they came and visited the community, they knew that we were very far behind. Mm -hmm. So one of the things they asked for was that they said that if there was a job, especially senior position in the civil service, mm -hmm. if there was a senior position service opening up, especially with the colonial civil servants living in the country mm -hmm. or the white officers living in the country, mm -hmm. please give the job to the most qualified Sabahan or the most qualified Sarawakians. And there's a feeling that, you know, bonionization did not happen. Mm. In fact, there has been a reverse takeover of many of the functions that was part of the civil service in Sabah, so it was mm. taken over. Mm -hmm. Example of that was that education was centralized. Yeah. Okay? So I think there is a lot of unhappiness about that. And in fact, uh, just last year, there was a court case in Sabah where uh, two Sabahans actually tried to launch a court case on this issue. Yeah. Unfortunately, the case was thrown out. Another issue related to safeguards and autonomy is the issue of religion, and here I'm specifically talking about the position of Islam. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, it was uh, uh, written in black and white that while the people of Sabah and Sarah and the leaders agreed that to the wording that Islam is the religion of the Federation, yeah. there were not supposed to be any state religion in Sabah and Sarah. Mm -hmm. And as you know, there was a, a constitution amendment in, in, in Sabah, yeah. and uh, Islam is now the state religion of Sabah. Issue of PTI and border security, I've mentioned already. Mm. But on the financial issue, um, if you read it carefully, 40% mm. uh, of net revenue from Sabah is supposed to be returned to the states. Mm -hmm. uh, that has not happened. The last time it happened was in the early 70s. But more important in recent years, the argument is over who owns the continental shelf. Mm -hmm. uh, as you know, right, uh, Sabah and Sarawak hold the bulk of the oil and gas thing in Malaysia besides uh, Trengadu. Mm -hmm. So uh, whoever owns the continental shelf is in for Bonanza. Yeah. So that's the reason why you see all this movement as the question you asked me about why, mm. why they're doing all this sort of thing. And of course, the last thing in relation to safeguard autonomy is that um, they feel that basically if there's politics in those two states, you should leave the local people to sort it out. Mm -hmm. You should not try to intervene. And I said, as I mentioned, in Sarawak, there was imposition of emergency rule. In Sabah in 85, yeah. during the short period, 85, 86, the federal government nearly, nearly imposed emergency yeah. rule. Yeah. But in 1990, they intervened directly by exporting the West Mission yeah. uh, parties over there. That's right. The third issue, big issue, is the promise of Malaysia. Mm -hmm. And this one is very general, to, uh, very general and very easy to understand. Uh, the reasons that, key reason that Sabah, uh, sorry, North Borneo and Sarawak joined the federation was that the people on this side and Singapore were supposed to help them to develop. Yes. The idea was that, you know, for example, it was understood clearly that, as I mentioned earlier, the Bumi population on the other side helped to balance out the racial arithmetic. But more importantly, the Bumutra rule, which states that the Malays will get affirmative action here, was supposed to apply on both sides yes. as well, pull out the Bumutra population and generally help the states to develop. Mm -hmm. So people asking, how come there are significant parts of Sarawak where you still don't get pipe water, mm -hmm. no electricity? And how come after 50 years, there's still no Borneo Highway, you're still thinking about building it? Mm -hmm. Only now you actually put money into it and you know, it will not be ready for the next few years. Mm -hmm. And the reason why this come out is that, uh, like you, Jahaba, you have actually done your road trip. One of the interesting things is that the roads are very windy. Suddenly you reach the Brunei border. Yeah. Fantastic highway. Exactly. All the way until you reach, the <laughs> you Sabah, reach border, Sabah. Yeah. So people can see, they say, how can this be? Yeah. And they come over to this side, they say, wow, uh, north-south highway. I can drive from Penang all the way to Singapore, mm. you know, 100, 100 kilometers an yeah, hour. Yeah. Of course, I with the ticket and what sort of thing, yes, but sir. still I can yeah. do it. But I can't do that. Those of you who have driven between Kuchi and Cebu, you will realize how windy the road is. Yes. You know, if you get car sickness easily, I will not recommend I, that it's, trip. It's still a, a, a road that was built by the British uh, a long time ago. Yes, and yes, no, yes. No improvement. Yes. In fact, very interesting you said that because I, I spoke to a federal minister. I won't name him. He's actually from Sarawak. And I mentioned why is there a lot of uh, infrastructure projects in the federal territory of Kuala Lumpur um, you know, when it's an opposition held, uh, most of the districts are opposition held. 
Um, and, he, and he said very simply, because this is where the money is made. And from, from the money made here, then we will take that money and develop both Sarawak and Sabah. Um, and of course, he said this about maybe less than eight years ago. And, and then Pan, the Pan Borneo Highway was again mentioned, which I, I think, so I've been a journalist now for nearly 30 years. I think anyone who's been a journalist for 50 years would have heard it mm. through its various reincarnations all the time. So I can understand uh, the feelings of my fellow citizens from Sabah and Sarawak about this matter. Uh, but I also understand that, that their leaders were also co-opted to, to, to make this great change in the 70s that changed uh, Sabah and Sarawak into one of 13 states rather than one of three territories, Malaya, Sa uh, Sabah and Sarawak. Mm -hmm. right? uh, so going to that, uh, we've seen how these issues have cropped up. Uh, we have a very dominant uh, section of the federal government, which is actually from Sabah and Sarawak. And now they also have some key positions in cabinet. And I think so, one of the questions that was asked, uh, and, and so now we're going to go into this, we're actually extending this, this Facebook, oh, oh, right? one hour. Yeah, because, you know, when you have an academic, he can really <laughs> go on. But we're extending it to 8.55, which is now 10 minutes. So I've got 12 questions to ask. We'll go through it. Uh, Professor James Chin will answer why I ask him, and I'm going to ask him the more interesting questions. I'm not going to ask, ask 10 questions. Um, do you think this? One of the interesting questions is the Malaysia Agreement in 1963 is an international agreement. Yes. It was lodged with the United Nations. Yes. Uh, it has a registration number of 10760. And so the question is can the Malaysian Parliament amend the terms of the Malaysia Agreement 63? If no, then maybe. The reason to why is there such reluctance uh, for the federal government, i.e. Putrajaya, to adhere to it, uh, to this agreement? Uh, there seems to be this speculation that this agreement is not being adhered to by Putrajaya, which, as you have mentioned, yes, they're, they're, some parts are not being respected. So, what is Sabah and Sarawak doing about it apart from what we see in the last uh, two years? Sure. Well, I think we've reached a, a certain stage in our political development where mm -hmm in relation to this issue of Malaysia agreement, that mm. there's basically two options before us. One is to do nothing, carry on the, the way we've been carrying on. The other is to do something. And I think I want to reiterate the point that, you know, in order to do something, there must be a clear consensus among the political class in Sabah and Sarawak mm. about what they want to do. Mm -hmm. And I think very often people get mired and talk about the details about a certain line or certain sentence in the Malaysia Agreement and they miss out the whole big picture. Mm -hmm. And they get bought down by this so much so that they spend all the time arguing whether it's legal or not legal. Mm -hmm. You have to understand this is a political agreement and mm -hmm. therefore the solution can only be found in the political arena. Mm -hmm. uh, my own take is that the federal government is quite serious under Najib. In fact, he has set up a thing called the Technical Committee mm -hmm. on the Devolution of Authority. Mm -hmm. And the idea is, is that some of the powers that were centralized during the Mahathir era, we will give it back to the Sabah and Sarawak, Kuching and Katakin Balu. Mm. Now, what people don't realize is that on top of this uh, committee, which is led by Sabahan, the foreign minister, and Nancy, from uh, the minister so, from Sarawak, mm -hmm. at the state level in Kuching and Katakin Balu, they also have another committee working on the same thing, mm -hmm. same issues. So I think things are moving. Uh, my take on the situation is that I suspect uh, AMNO or the federal led government mm. will not do any constitutional amendment, but they will remove all the administrative stuff that was centralized. Any administrative rules can be pushed back to Kota Just, and just by an administrative Yes, uh, yes. Yeah. Because when you talk about a political solution, right, it really is at the cabinet level. They can say very simple things like education. Mm -hmm. Okay? Sarawak so want to run their own English school. Mm -hmm. We let them run it. Mm -hmm. Okay, we will just simply make a note so that Sarawak has, in terms of uh, issuing of license, they have the authority to do it. Mm -hmm. That's always actually quite simple mm -hmm. because, as you know, right, in many of the ads in, in, in Malaysia, as you know, right, there's always one part of the ad in any ad in Malaysia written that says that ministers have the discretion. Mm -hmm. So it's just a question of the Minister of Education using his discretionary power and so that Sabah and Sarawak can do their own English language school if they want to. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of this administrative thing can be done and I think if they were to do it, it will create a lot of goodwill. But in terms of the really, really big picture items, 
I think we really need a serious discussion among the political class, as I said, mm. in Sabah and Sarawak, where there must be a clear consensus. But because we are mired too much, if you read the Facebook, the blogs, everything, people keep arguing, oh, the process was, was fixed and therefore it's not legit. Mm. Um, I myself, you know, looking through the whole process, I'm not saying that it's legit. Mm. It is true that it was fixed. But you are using 2017 norms and eyes to look back something that happened in the Cold War era. Yeah, yeah. That was the norm during the Cold War yeah. era. If you want to talk about fix, uh, as again, coming back to India, millions of people died because the British purposely drew the line yeah. the wrong way. Yeah. So, I mean, I mean uh, if you want to keep looking back, then I can say, let's look back in the 18th century and see who actually owns uh, <laughs> yes. Sabah, who owns Rao. So, you cannot just keep looking back. But having said that, I would say yes, understand the process and maybe use the cobalt thing or the 20 points as the basis for discussion and mm -hmm. come to some sort of political consensus. Mm -hmm. Because once the leadership in Kuching and the leadership in KK have a consensus, then that is the basis of negotiating with Putrajaya. Because right now you really can't negotiate because the bottom line is that there is so much stuff being put out there, especially through social media, mm -hmm. that is actually quite confusing. But there is a general mood in Sabah and Sarawak that something needs to change. So as I mentioned, we only have two options. Do nothing or do something. Mm -hmm. I personally would suggest that we do something. But we do it in such a way that does not lead to more problems in the future. Mm -hmm. You know, I do not want a situation where my grandchildren will come and say, you know, mm -hmm. the Federation did not work because something happened in the 1950s and 1960s and then in the year 2017, 2020, they did something again, it didn't work. Mm -hmm. So I think something like this, you sort of need to step back, think carefully and look what are the viable options, what are not viable options. Again, with the simple understanding that this is a political problem, you need a political solution and there must be goodwill on all sides and understand that this issue is real people are highly emotional over it. So for example, I always tell my friends in Peninsula, Malaysia, there's actually quite a large group of people in Sabah and Sarawak who seriously think that, you know, it's not going to work anymore. After 50 years, we should go our own way. Mm. There are sentiments like that on yeah. the ground. Mm. And that if you don't deal with it, this sort of thing, you know, as they say, you keep cooking, 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 and sooner or later, you yeah. But you so what, So trouble. one of the things is, we talk about uh, a political solution, do you see, because you go back to Sabah and Sarawak as and when you can, uh, are both uh, leadership of both the states, are they working together on this vis-a-vis -vis with Putrajaya or at cross purposes? Or are they looking at the fine detail and differ on approach and uh, what they want? No, I think there's a general consensus that, uh, that something has to be done and that basically we're looking at the first stage, the devolution of powers we want to tap back a lot of the things that we want to control, things like education, language issue, uh, some parts of uh, some other stuff like security issues. Um, so they are, have technical committees that work about which laws that we can bring back, mm -hmm. what are the administrative stuff that we need to this do. This is to back to the five panels that, uh, that they're looking uh, no, to. The, no, no, no. But not all five issues. Like. That's right. But there are all sets of issues. Like I said, there's a technical committee uh, mm -hmm. state level and they're mm -hmm. working through the issues. They're trying to connect with the federal committee, so they're trying to uh, put the paper together for cabinet. But it seems to me, in terms of moving forward, federal state relation really is about two things. The first is the constitutional structure, mm -hmm. and I think that can, you really need to think seriously, what is the constitutional structure? Because at the present moment, basically our constitutional structure is that we have what we call three lists. Mm -hmm. First list is exclusive power of the federal government, yeah. second list is the exclusive power of the state government. Mm -hmm. It is the third list where you combine the power. Yeah. I think we need to do something about that. So we need to look at the constitutional structure and that will require constitution amendment. And that one I think we need really to think seriously and think deeply because whatever you do now will have consequences in the future. Yeah. Second thing I think we need some sort of a MO in terms of political relationship between the centre and the state. Mm -hmm. And here it is quite complicated. Uh, again, people don't seem to understand that it's not a matter of Putrajaya saying that we must behave this way, behave that way. Mm. Because on this side in Malaya, right, we also have also unique states. Yes. As I mentioned, Kelantan tried to stop the formation of Malaysia. Yeah. And, and the, what they call the Johor Sultanate has always been strong and assertive from day one. Yes. So again, it is not a black and white situation. 
in po Malaysian politics is all about colors, gray, multiple dimensions. Yes. It's like Doctor Who. Yes. <laughs> you never know what's you going never to know what's gonna happen. Yeah. So I think uh, we need cool heads and we really need to 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 agree that at the end of this process it is a political process. So let's move slowly, think carefully, and don't do anything that will create more problems in the future. So the bottom line for me is basically to tell the Malaysian population that this unhappiness in Sabah and Sarawak is real. Mm -hmm. Historical, historically, Not there hysterical. are reasons for the grievances. Yes. But the problem is that the Malaysian population, especially on this side, don't understand yeah. the, the historical facts. On the Sabah and Sarawak side, there is a lot of selective memory, again, creating a lot of misunderstanding. But at the end of the day, second takeaway point, federal state relationship, two things, constitutional structure, political process. We are now dealing with the political part, mm -hmm. trying to find a consensus, negotiate between Putrajaya, Kuching and Kota Kanbalu. Mm -hmm. It is paramount that this will be successful because this will lead to the constitutional stuff. Mm -hmm. So unless we do it step by step, it's not going to work. Okay. One last question. Uh, this is from a viewer by the name of Jaffa Ismail. says, what are the odds of devolution whereby Borneo states achieve a greater degree of autonomy? What are the odds for that to happen? The odds are very, very good. In fact, I can quite confidently say that uh, more powers will be devolved to the state. Um, the only question mark is that the window of opportunity is very small. As I mentioned, the sort of the, the precursor is 2008. It's because the MPs of Sabah and Sarawak are crucial to the maintenance of the regime up here. Now, you can foresee in a situation where in some election, maybe not the next one, maybe the following, whatever, I don't know, mm -hmm. where the political party in power on this side mm -hmm. may not require the MP from the other side anymore. Yes. If that happens, obviously, <laughs> The political state managed between the state and the federal will change and the dynamics yeah, will change yeah, again. Yeah. So for me, the window opportunity is limited by the five year election cycle. Okay. So so in, in other words, they have to strike it now. Yes. Before the next general election because the balance could could change. Yes. I'm not saying next election. I'm just saying that it is limited by the five year window. I see. I'm not gonna make any predictions of elections. Okay. If you want to know election result, Call me four or five days before polling, then I'll be able to tell you. Great. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for watching um, this inside talk with Professor James Chin of the Asia Center, University of Tasmania, on Sabah and Sarawak and Malaysia. Um, Selamat Hari Kebangsaan and have a good night. Thank you very much. <laughs>